So I heard you wanted another best player on every hero video. You ask and you shall receive. I've been getting requests for this to come back before season 3 even finished. Now that I'm on winter break at my university, it's time to make this a reality. A lot of you seem to like comparing your takes to mine despite me being nowhere close to an expert. Anyway though, it's time to deliver, so sit back and relax and enjoy the video. Let's get a few things straight. For one, I beg of you to keep in mind that these are only my opinions, and none of what I am saying should be seen as a fact. With that said, it's perfectly fine if you disagree with anything I say. However, I do not welcome insults and general rudeness if you disagree. To be completely honest, if you get mad over something some random dude says on the internet, that's your problem. I don't really care if you baby rage over me not mentioning your favorite player or anything like that. Also, please refrain from making one of those comments that spoils the entire video in every selection that I make, because if I see one of those comments, I'm just going to delete it and block you from commenting on any of my future videos. I work really hard on this stuff, and I want people to watch it. A few other housekeeping things before I get started, though. One, a player can only be up for consideration on a hero if they actually played them in an official game this year. Two, I will likely back up some selections with stats from the Overwatch League Stats Lab. And three, we're going from left to right on the hero selection screen. Alright, with introductions officially out of the way, let's get started, and kicking us off is none other than D.Va. So off tank is a pretty stacked position as we all know, and there's a lot of good D.Va players in the league. I mean, how can you possibly go wrong with somebody like Fury, Choi Obin, or even Hanbin, and the list just keeps going on. See? I remembered Fury this time, guys. Don't scream at me in anger, please. It's extremely close, but in my opinion, I believe Void was the number one D.Va in Season 3. I can hear the crying now. Fury this, Fury that. Well, guess what? Void was more consistent in my opinion. The Matrixes were on point, he had big bombs in the clutch, and his style of play was out of this world. Like with Janu in Season 2, Void was all over the place all the time. He got so much done while playing with unbelievable levels of intelligence. I know it's not the case for everybody, but for me personally, the stats tell you a lot with a character like D.Va. His averages per 10 across the board are all near the top. And unlike some of the other bloodthirsty D.Va players out there, he gets his contributions in efficiently with only 3 deaths per 10 minutes. Just to put that into perspective, he's died 144 times in 8 hours on that hero. That's the same as Choi who has an hour and a half less playtime. He does so much right, so I just simply had to pick him. Again, it's a very close contest, but Void is my number one. Now let's talk Orisa, everybody's favorite tank in the game, Kappa. In all seriousness, I truly do believe one man stood head and shoulders above the rest, and his name is Smurf. I know it's just Orisa, so nobody really cares that much, but Smurf unironically did put in the work on Orisa. In my opinion, he got the most value out of Holt usages, and he oftentimes decided the outcomes of fights with it. There was nobody better at setting up plays. Remember that Moth 3k against Toronto or whatever it was? That was made possible by Smurf. He does everything right with how he plays this character, and just because I love the stats, I wanted to point out that he's top 2 on every single damage category with the averages. He was arguably the best last year at this hero, and now he's retaining his title. There are very few people in the league who can get as much done on Orisa. Some honorable mentions go out to Ryo and Gator as well though, because I also thought they were quite good. Next up, we have the pain train from Germany, Reinhardt. For me, there's only two realistic options, Super or Sato. Both of them, in my opinion, were the most impactful on this character. Super would often come in as the specialist in 2020. He'd come in to play the Rhine on specific maps, and he would crush the competition. His aggressive style provided a lot of extra damage, which is evident by his damage rate, which is number two in the league. This was accompanied by a rather high death rate, but it's not the end of the world considering most Rhine players were dying close to the same amount. Looking at Sato, he thrived on Ryan during the early stages of Season 3, and he truly appeared to be in his comfort zone when Ryan was meta. He was putting up similar damage numbers to Super while dying only 5.1 times per 10 minutes, which is only higher than Fearless who played the character way less. A legit case can be made for Sato as the number one Ryan. His style was a bit more team-oriented compared to Super's, but he still put in a lot of work. The fusion also generally dominated when Ryan was meta at the beginning of the season, but it's not exactly fair to compare because the Shock only played this meta for like a few games. Again, it's very very close, but I'm picking Super to retain his title as the number one Reinhardt. There's a certain level of energy he brings on this character. It's hard to explain with words. Whenever he came in, he lifted the Shock's energy levels way up. Sure there were some times where he fed, but that's Reinhardt for ya. Plus, he more than made up for it with some insane plays. When the Shock let him off his leash, he 
dominated the competition with relative ease. The Earth Shatters were almost always massive, and generally speaking, I loved the individual plays he made. Mr. Matthew DeLisi has this level of swag to his Ryan. No disrespect to Sato here, but Super's the man. Next will be Roadhog. Given that this character was only relevant for one meta, there's not this overly massive sample size to go off, but I would say the best hogs this year were Jester, Janu, and Super. Jester had this way of finding a lot of efficiency with his cooldowns. Janu was all around dominant in most of the games during the playoff run, and Super came up big on those control maps a lot of the time. You can make a case for each and every one of them for sure. But Hog is a simple character, so there's no point in thinking about this too hard. I'm going with Janu as the best Hog of Season 3. I know we often look at Decay and Stitch as the big carries of that playoff run and even Tuba sometimes, but Janu was doing a lot of the dirty work. As the third or fourth option on the team, he was not getting that hard pocket. He made a lot of plays on his own as a result, and the fact that he could still stand out despite Decay and Stitch playing out of their minds is impressive. Realistically speaking, I don't see a problem in giving it to any of these guys I mentioned, but Janu did kind of get the best of Super at times during their playoff meeting, and with Gesture it felt like it was more about the DPS than him in my opinion. Janu was the best all-around hog, and I'm a big fan of somebody who is well-balanced, so Janu was the best option in my opinion. Next up we have Sigma. There's a lot of fantastic Sigma players in the league, much like with D.Va, but for me it comes down to either Krong or Hanbin. Krong has that silent carry vibe to him, and that conservative style that got him recognized as an MVP candidate. Meanwhile, Hanbin makes a bit more noise with his aggression. I know I'm probably going to get a lot of anger and hate from my Krong fans, but I'm going with Hanbin. I just can't ignore the stupid number of contributions he's made this year. He's the star of the show. Much like Void on D.Va, this guy never stops. He's number one on all damage stats across the board. He had this way of just applying constant pressure that I have fallen in love with. He makes Sigma as close to a carry hero as you can possibly get because Sigma isn't really designed to be a carry hero, and yet he has found a way to go ahead and do so. He was not perfect by any means, but he helped Paris out so much. Right from the moment he turned 18, he became a reliable playmaker who helped hold down the four even when Exe and Sparkle were not available. Now it's time for Winston, everybody's favorite monkey. I'll cut right to the chase. If I did not shout out Smurf and Fearless and pick between one of these two, I'm pretty sure I would get canceled on the internet. And thankfully for me, I do think it's between these two. Fearless got all the love this year despite Smurf being right there with him. Sometimes people forget about Smurf simply because he plays for the shock, I feel like. These are two very, very comparable players. But simply going off the individual carries, I think I'm going with Fearless as my number one Winston. Let's be honest, without his help, there's no guarantee that Shanghai complete that reverse sweep against the Dynasty in the main melee. How on earth do you manage to be a top tier damage dealer on this character while still not even dying 5 times a game? This is Winston we're talking about, a character that gets insta-melted against the absurd amount of crowd control in this game. Sure he played for a dominant team, but a certain level of intelligence comes into play here. Fearless is an absolute freak of nature, so I had to go with him. Now it's Wrecking Ball time. Sadly, there's not a very big sample size here simply because only 11 players touched this hero for at least an hour, and to be completely honest, many of them are not eye catchers. The only people I truly believe could be chosen here are Among and Mono. The stats don't exactly jump out at you with Mono, but he did have a pretty large impact on the NYXL when Ball was meta in the APAC region for those couple of weeks or whatever it was. He made some of the other great Ball players in this league look like complete chums, but that's not enough for me. Sorry Mono fans, but I gotta go with the Yada Chad, and it's for one simple reason. Almost every single one of Chengdu's wins in 2020 came from playing Ball comps. That time they beat Shanghai at the start of the year, guess what hero they played? Or what about during that stretch where they won 4 straight? Out of the 8 total times they won if you include playoff games, they won over half with Among primarily playing Wrecking Ball. Many of Chengdu's biggest wins came with Among at the helm with this character, and I simply can't go against that. Plus, he genuinely still does get absurd amounts of value on that character. Even when Wrecking Ball still wasn't the meta, he found a way to make it work a lot of the time. More than anyone else in the league at the very least. Wrapping up the tanks is none other than Zarya. For me, there's only one realistic option and one realistic option only. It's gotta be Decay. Nobody carried his hard. It's a thing of beauty. Over four hours of him putting the justice on his back and beaming people to death. Listen, there's some other pretty nasty Zaryas, but Decay showed some masterful gameplay. I know he memed about not worrying about his teammates and just killing everything in sight, but if you watch his gameplay closely, the bubble usage was definitely on point. 
He always seemed to use the teammate bubbles at the perfect time. It's some of the best discipline and patience I've ever seen. Most of the time it felt like he was on high energy, which essentially just makes him a third DPS. Even the shock were caught in this nightmare scenario where they weren't quite sure what to do. When one guy can cause that much chaos at the tank position, it's pretty safe to say he's one of the top players of this hero without a doubt. And that is going to conclude the tanks. Now it's time for DPS, and first in the order is Ash. This character has been good for quite a while now, and many pros have emerged as dominant forces. There's Ans, KSP, BQB, and many, many more. Ants is a good choice simply because of the overwhelming numbers. What makes KSP and BQB stand out is that they bailed out their teams out of trouble many, many times. This especially goes for KSP, and that's the exact reason why I'm picking him as my number one Ash of Season 3. Shax deserves a lot of the praise for the Valiant success too, but oh man, whenever KSP came into the game on that Ash, it felt like this X Factor of sorts. It was very evident in those close games against Florida where he outdueled BQB, mind you, as well as that reverse sweep against Atlanta. Him and BQB have almost identical playtime, but he has noticeably more final blows and hero damage. He's got the same final blow to death ratio as Ans as well. This one is highly up for debate, I admit that, and I find myself switching up my opinion all the time. When there's this many dominant Ash players to compare, you kind of feel lost, so I'm just going to go with KSP because he's one of the safer options available. Next is Bastion. Only one player touched this character for more than two minutes, so there's not much to go off here. Edison is the only player in the league who played this character for longer than a flash, so by default, I guess that makes him the best Bastion. And if you can recall, him and Atlanta actually did make Bastion work that one time where they whipped it out against Paris, I believe, and it was pretty cool. If it weren't for Edison, we might have had to leave this one blank. Anyway, that's all I got, nothing else to say, let's keep the ball rolling. Let's talk Doomfist, aka another character with practically no playtime. Statistically, there's a few guys that are alright, like Tuba and Edison, but I'm going to give this one to Sparkle. I recall him squashing Vancouver and Toronto like bugs, and that one time he switched to it to get back to point faster against Philly in the Summer Showdown. He's got more memories on this character than anybody else. Throw in 28 limbs and 12 final blows per 10, and boom. It's not saying much considering how rarely this character gets picked, but he still is the best. Now for a more relevant hero, it's Echo Time. Those few weeks of this character being a must pick in the league yielded some very interesting results. Only the best of the best flex DPS players could truly unlock this hero's true potential. When it comes to unleashing said potential, I believe Rascal and Fleta did it the best. Two of the top teams in the league had a world class Echo. Quite shocking, I know. I kid you not though, I nearly considered this one a tie. Both had that proficiency I was looking for. But upon further examination of some gameplay, I came to the conclusion that Rascal has the edge by the narrowest of margins. It has nothing to do with kills or stats or anything like that. For me, it comes down to copy usage. Echo is all about maximizing versatility. Fleta can play a deep range of heroes as well, but the way Rascal can pick up heroes almost instantly made this character a perfect fit for him. We saw him do work on DPS, tanks, and healers alike. Rascal could show off his true talents on a hero like Echo, and I think the results speak for themselves. It's a close contest for sure, but the insane copies give Rascal the slight edge. How about we go over Genji now? So many of the fantastic projectile players in the league rejoiced as this character joined the meta for a bit, but I gotta say, out of all Genji players, both OG and New School alike, Sparkle was clearly the best. The Summer Showdown tournament alone is going to tell you that. How many clutch blades did he have? How many highlights in general? It's ridiculous. When looking at every single Genji player in the league with at least one hour of playtime, you're quickly going to discover that he leads every single damage category with the averages. He's the only one with 11 final blows and the only one with 9k damage per 10 minutes. He's the Genji King. He outplayed all of the Genji legends and it was his play that helped Paris take down the shock and the fusion back to back. There's no other person I would even consider going with here. From one Shimada brother to the next, who is the number one Hanzo? For some, this is going to seem a little controversial, but I'm going with Ivy. I know he has way less time on this hero than somebody like Prophet, Fitz, or even Striker, but something about his Hanzo really stood out for me. Philly pretty much never had him play it, and yet he dominated every single time he got the chance, basically. That match against the Justice was one of the most dominant Hanzo performances I've seen in ages. Even in a losing effort against the Soul Dynasty, he did everything in his power to fight back with 26 final blows in only 2 maps. Another great thing about Ivy's Hanzo is that he is at the top for basically everything. For all my Prophet Fits and Striker advocates, Ivy has more than if not as many elims per 10 and more damage than all of them. It's very close and definitely up for debate, but that's my opinion on it anyhow. 
How about we look at Junkrat now? Junk was another one of those rare to see characters with only two players breaking the half hour mark. He's such a niche hero so it doesn't matter all that much who you pick here. I personally am going with Bird Ring though. He led the league in final blows by far with anybody who played this character for at least 10 minutes, plus he also hits the 10k damage mark and has the best elim rate per 10. And I mean, that teleporter Riptire against Toronto though, kind of 5 head, not gonna lie. Or how about when he casually opens up a round by killing both Valiant supports in a critical map 5. Bird Ring really did dominate and be clutch using this character on control maps in map 5 scenarios. Lee Zhang against the Valiant and Nepal against Toronto. Absolute mad lad and superstar DPS. McCree time. When this character got played at the beginning of the season, there were so many amazing McCrees everywhere you looked. Lip, Aunt, Exe, Decay, KSP, Striker, and even more. I mean, it's absolutely stacked. I could spend the entire video praising all of them, but I'm picking Exe. The Exe Cree has been on my radar since week one. The amount of time he's popped off on this character is pretty insane. It's not even the numbers either. Look back at some of the earliest weeks of the year. Look how he smoked veterans of the game like they were nothing. What I like even more is his ability to perform on this character in the clutch. I mentioned Sparkle before with the Summer Showdown run, but Exe deserves a lot of the praise too. Remember all the times he got those fight ceiling kills on the flank or simply not missing any shots? Because I certainly do. Exe all the way. Now we move on to the Devil, also known as Mei. It's disappointing to remember this, but this evil character was very powerful for the first bit of the season, and she continued to have relevance at some other points as well. I'll be honest, there's two guys above the rest that I simply have to choose from. They're Ivy and Rascal. Their understanding of this hero is better than everybody else's. They're at another level. For this year though, I think I'm going to pick Ivy. Him and Rascal's understanding is equal, but he has the edge with wall usage in my opinion. I always try to look at that matchup with Washington in the playoffs as the prime example of him putting these skills on display, but upon further research, you're quickly going to find he does this kind of stuff all the time. When you can not only screw over your enemies, but also save your teammates, you have truly mastered this hero. Furthermore, he's tied for the least number of deaths per 10 minutes among all players with at least an hour of playtime on May. He's a freak, and enough said there. Next on the list is Pharah. It's another instance where a character did not have much relevance in the league. So many hit skins were good and Echo is literally just better than this character. As a result, not many players were extremely effective on Pharah. So I'm just going to say it's profit and move on with my life. He led the way on hero damage and final blows, so why not? That Pharah of his gave a lot of APAC teams trouble in the playoffs. No matter the map and no matter the strategy, Soul could always count on him to hit the shots. Fair is a tough character to talk about this year because it's not like in Season 2 where you have somebody like Ding simply putting the team on his back to win some sort of championship. Sure, Prophet popped off on this character, but not quite to that extent, so we're going to leave it at that and move on to the next character. That character will be Reaper. For Reaper, I'm going to pick BQB straight up. I'm not sure if this is going to be seen as questionable or not, but he's always the first person who comes to mind for me when talking about the league's best Reapers. Like, yeah, he's moderately good on all the stats and everything, but Florida also played some of their best Overwatch, arguably, when he was on that character, which is something you usually can't say with this type of hero, I feel like. It's a shame his team desperately needed him on Sombra on the playoffs because his Reaper's kind of nutty. Because that time he did play it against the Gladiators, it was insane. Also, BQB versus Paris, though. This man has Reaper superiority. Speaking of characters not used a lot, we're on to Soldier 76. This guy was literally meta for one week. Yes, he was revived from the dead for an entire week and that's it. When you only have a handful of players who touch this guy for 10 minutes, there's not much to say. There's not much to hype up either, so I'm picking Exe. All I'm gonna say is he kind of rolled Philly in the epic 5 map series at the beginning of the year. The amount of times he was sniping Carpe and other people with Helix Rockets on Oasis was kind of ridiculous. There's not much to base this off of because all of Soldier's playtime pretty much came from this one week unless you're Chengdu who ran him at the weirdest times. Exe was big clutch and he kind of made Ivy look like a noob in comparison, so that's good enough for me. With that said, we're moving on to Sombra. The top players in my opinion were Lip and Hisu. Shanghai depended on the Lip Sombra as a pivotal part of their game plan much of the time and he pretty much played her at an elite level all year. He farms EMP better than pretty much anybody else and he's just crazy. Up until recently, I thought he was the best. But after the playoffs, I kind of came to the realization I think it's Hisu. 
Lip got a lot of EMPs, but didn't always find immense value with them. There's countless moments from multiple games where you can find this, where he kind of just isn't there with the timing, or nobody's there to follow up. He, so I feel, suffers from this a lot less. That, and I believe he plays more intelligently. He's always looking for those high-value hacks. He doesn't just spam it or anything like that. He's constantly looking for the perfect target, and I believe it's a big reason why Philly made such a deep playoff run. Sombra requires some godlike decision-making, and Hisu has that over Lip, in my opinion. Let's get back into irrelevant characters, shall we? It's Symmetra time. For how he played at the beginning of the season, I'll pick Exe for this one. He genuinely did make Paris a tough team to crack when he whipped her out on control maps. Besides beaming people to death and all that good stuff, he did have a few crafty teleporters as well. I'll still never forget that time against Toronto back in week one. Pretty awesome stuff, but Sim is Sim. There's not much else to discuss, so now we're on to Torbjörn. Torb was primarily used as a way to counter dive comps and tracer, but even so, he's not someone who was used all that much either. Honorable mention goes out to Rascal because I thought he was consistently good at this hero, but I'll be selecting Carpe. I don't know if there's a particular reason, like, it's Torb. You put down a turret and you shoot dive heroes, it's a very simple thing. But he's got a sizable lead in elims and final blow averages, so why not? He bodied Paris and Washington, that's all I really have to say. Now back to some characters we can talk a bit more about. It's Tracer time. There were a lot of Tracer players who were an absolute joy to watch, like Decay, Shax, Edison, Fleta, Yaki, Carpe, Dante, it goes on and on. There's so many. But unfortunately, I don't believe any of them are consistently better than Striker. The Striker Tracer is goaded. I don't know how else to explain it. No matter the opponent, you can always count on Striker to show up on that signature Tracer of his. I like to describe his style of play as relentless. He hits the go button all the time, and it works. He's a killing machine. If he catches you out of position or making some sort of mistake, you're dead every single time. That's what puts him above and beyond the other tracers in the league, in my opinion. It feels like he finds success on his solo missions more often than not. How can he be clutch in pretty much every game he plays? Like, it's beyond my belief. Striker is the tracer overlord, and he defends his title from season 2 with ease. Finishing off the DPS is Widowmaker. The amount of elite Widow players in the league this year was kind of insane, because this hero has continued to evolve over time in terms of her skill ceiling. Big time honorable mentions go out to Bird Ring, Decay, KSP, Carpe, Happy, Glister, and Diem. But unfortunately for them, Ons exist. It sounds stupid to say out loud, but Ons was clearly at the top in my opinion. Nobody could consistently topple him and be at his level. Some people could keep up with him here and there if they were hot, but you rarely saw someone get the best of him for an entire game. Here's how I see it. He was not only the best counter sniper, but also the best fragger in general. I value counter sniping enough on its own. I firmly believe you should automatically be considered one of the best widows if you're constantly out sniping the enemy. If they can't keep up with you or you're giving them no breathing room whatsoever, then you're playing that character the right way. Plus, Ans has all the other crazy shenanigans with just landing off the headshots. Ans is out of his mind on Widow. End of story. And here we are at supports. First is Ana. While there's a lot of Ana players I really enjoyed watching in season three, I have to give this to Alarm. Twilight is right there with him, but he didn't play nearly as much as Alarm, so I felt like Alarm was the safest bet. His reactionary sleep darts are some of the clutchest I've ever seen. Whether it be on a Genji or a Sombra in the middle of her EMP animation, he was always looking like Jaehong in his prime. Something I also like about Alarm is the positioning and overall IQ. Nearly 8 hours of Ana with less than 4 deaths per 10 is pretty insane. He might not be the healing leader or anything like that, but he still does reach that 10k average healing club. I love Alarm's Ana so much. He plays this hero the exact way a wannabe armchair analyst like me wants him to. Even when Alarm is not red hot and he's not hitting every cooldown, he puts his team in a position to win just by being smarter than everybody else. Next up is Baptiste. There's three I could realistically choose from. Alarm, Violet, or Twilight. They're all pretty cracked, but I'm going to pick Violet this time. He might not lead the league on healing by a long shot, but 12k on average is still very nice, and he makes up for it by being the bloodthirstiest Bap we've ever seen. I don't know how he did it, but he was just a menace. The shock are so, so unfair. How do they manage to have the best Bap two years in a row? First Rascal during the GOATS era, and now this. Violet makes this character feel like a DPS. We're not even talking about Zen, mind you. It's amazing, to be honest. Violet is just one of a kind, and he keeps getting better. Next thing you'll tell me is he somehow becomes the best Ana in Season 4, even though that's his worst character. 
Next is Brigitte. Lots of good Brig players to go around. FD God, Alarm, Violet, Twilight, there's plenty of others. They're all pretty solid, but I was kind of digging the Lee J. Gone Brig this year. This character is perfect for him. This hero encourages aggression to a certain extent. What could be better for a main support who craves nothing but the blood of his enemies? If you're doing the damage, you're keeping that passive up. He stays alive quite a bit too. He might be a crazy Reddit Lucio, but he does not always play this character in a brain dead way. I say not always because it's Brigitte and there's always going to be a certain level of brain deadness to her just because of how powerful she is. But in terms of not going in too far and sticking with his team, he does it very well. I also really like the way he manages Briggs cooldowns. He's an all around solid player on a character that fits the way he likes to play. Simple as that. Speaking of Lucio, it's his turn, he's up. Some of you may be surprised when I say that I actually don't have Lee J Gone as the number one Lucio. He's in my top three or four for sure, but his aggression gets punished at times. We don't need to bring up that game against the Shock in the playoffs, now do we? Playing his crazy game works against the teams that can't punish it, but it's not the perfect style because the good teams are going to punish it. Consistency is what we're looking for. And that is why I prefer Moth as the best Lucio. I want to give a quick shout out to Funny Astro because I almost picked him, and FD God is also up there, but he kind of has the same problem as Lee J Gun. Anyway, Moth can turn up and make the big plays when he sees the opportunity arise, but he doesn't constantly try to make the plays by himself. Moth focuses more on supporting the team, which is what you want to do as Lucio. That's what matters when it comes down to going all the way in a playoff run in other big games. That's pretty evident by how much he heals his team, too. That's when Lucio is going to get the most value. He's not a carry hero, he's a team-oriented one. You're supposed to support your team with the speed and the heals and all that good stuff. And that is why Moth reigns supreme for a second year in a row. From one main support to another, it's mercy time. I feel like this character is hard to judge because there's not a lot of real mechanics to be looking at or anything. It's more about your decision making process. So long as you're not making any questionable decisions with res and your positioning and you're staying out of harm's way, odds are you're a pretty good mercy player. I guess other things like body blocking and whipping out the pistol occasionally are kind of important too, but not as much. With that said, some of my personal favorite Mercy players from Season 3 are Animo, Rain, Yvelto, and Mika, who I honestly think is a little underrated. Animo, Rain, and Mika die the least and heal the most on the leaderboards, so I feel like all of them are very reasonable selections, but there's something about Yveltal's mercy that I just find more appealing. I guess I just really like his timing with a lot of things. He always knows the right time to whip out the pistol and kill a sniper, and I feel like he gets slightly more value out of the resurrection than the others. He sticks behind cover and goes for the res when he knows his other teammates are not in immediate danger a lot of the time as well as himself. I could just be overly biased here, but it's only mercy, so no big deal I guess. While we're on the topic of sleeper heroes, that transitions us over to Moira. Click to heal go burr, easy damage go burr. It's only Moira, but I'll say that some of the better players were Violet, Gangnam Jin, and Crimzo. These are the guys who did a lot of damage, did a lot of healing, and did not die a lot. But you know what? I think I'm just going to pick Violet for the simple fact that he does 18,000 healing per 10 minutes, because that's kind of stupid. I still remember this time he got coalescence before Crimzo even reached 60% in a match. I guess you simply don't die if Violet is your Moira player. I've always liked his ult usage as well. Whether it's to hose down his teammates and keep them up in crucial moments or casually get three kills, he always finds value. And last, but certainly not least, is Zenyatta. People like Alarm, Jonek, Shu, and even Izayaki are all pretty insane, but to be completely honest, Violet clearly takes the cake in my opinion as the number one Zen. Listen, when your top two and final blows the number one with healing, eliminations, and damage per 10 minutes on a character like Zen, then it's safe to say you are rather dominant. He just gets so many kills and gets so much out of his transcendence. Then because he does so much damage, he's getting trans back quickly to continuously give his team the edge. He's a nutcase, and he knows it too. He fearlessly takes on enemy flankers and widows with mercy pockets for crying out loud because he knows he can win and he knows they're afraid of him. He plays with complete and utter confidence, but he also knows not to overstep his boundaries unlike some of the other great Zenyatta players of the game. How many times would he casually kill two or three then save the day with a trance? It's unreal. Nobody should have the right to be that scary on Zenyatta. He earns this title with ease for me. Well, there you go everybody. That is my best player on every hero for Overwatch League Season 3. I know many of you have really been looking forward to this and you've been requesting it all the time, so I do hope that you enjoyed the content. If you did, it would mean so much to me if you could give this video a like and subscribe if you're watching me for the first time. Also, feel free to leave your own best player on every hero down in the comment section. I would love to see how much your opinions differ from mine and how much we agree too even. And as always, thanks so much for watching, I really do appreciate your support, and until next time, this is ATP, 
signing out. Peace.